we are live and let's let us get back on the recording to the cloud here <clears throat> all right my mom is going to be reading the isaiah portion for us right now she's going to be starting at <clears throat> isaiah chapter one okay the vision concerning judah and jerusalem that isaiah son of amos saw during the reigns of uzziah yotham ahaz and hezekiah kings of judah Hear, O heavens, listen, O earth, for Yahuwah has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows his master, the donkey his owner's man manger. But Israel does not know, my people do not understand. Ah, sinful nation, a people loaded with guilt, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption they have forsaken yahuwah they have spurned the set apart one of yashrael and turned their backs on him why should you be beaten anymore why do you persist in rebellion your whole head is injured your whole heart afflicted from the sole of your foot to the top of your head there is no soundness only wounds and welts and open sores, not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with oil. Your country is desolate, your cities burned with fire. Your fields are being stripped by foreigners right before you, laid waste as when overthrown by strangers. The daughter of Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a hut in a field of melons, like a city under siege. Unless Yahuwah Almighty had left us some survivors, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. Hear the word of Yahuwah, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the law of your Elohim, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says Yahuwah? I have more than enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to meet with me, who has asked this of you? This trampling of my courts. Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moon, Sabbaths, and convocations. I cannot bear your evil assemblies. Your new moons, festivals, and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. <clears throat> Come now. Let us reason together, says Yahuwah. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the best from the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of Yahuwah has spoken. <clears throat> See how the faithful city has become a harlot. She once was full of justice. Righteousness used to dwell in her, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross. Your choice wine is diluted with water. Your rulers are rebels, companions of thieves. They all love bribes and chase after gifts. They do not defend the cause of the fatherless. The widow's case does not come before them. Therefore, Yahuwah, Yahuwah Almighty, the mighty one of Yashrael declares, Ah, I will get relief from my foes 
and avenge myself on my enemies. I will turn my hand against you. I will thoroughly purge away your dross and remove your impurities. I will restore your judges as in the days of old, your counselors as at the beginning. Afterward, you will be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion will be redeemed with justice, her pertinent ones with righteousness, but rebels and sinners will both be broken together, and those who forsake Yahuwah will perish. You will be ashamed because of the sacred oaks in which you have delighted. You will be disgraced because of the gardens that you have chosen. You will be like an oak with fading leaves, like a garden without water. The mighty man will become tinder and his work a spark. Both will burn together with no one to quench the fire. I looked up the word dross uh, yesterday when I was reading this, and it means like impurities, um, meaningless things. So, you know, because I wasn't sure myself what the meaning was of that word. Okay. Now, verse chapter 30. Woe to the obstinate children, declares Yahuwah. To those who carry out plans that are not mine, <clears throat> forming an alliance, but not by my spirit, keeping sin upon sin, who go down to Egypt without consulting me, who look for help to Pharaoh's protection, to Egypt's shade for refuge. But Pharaoh's protection will be to your shame. Egypt's shade will bring you disgrace. Though they have officials in zone and their envoys have arrived in Haines, everyone will be put to shame because of a people useless to them. Who brings neither help nor advantage, but only shame and disgrace? An or oracle concerning the animals of the Negev. Through a land of hardship and distress, of lions and lionesses, of adders and darting snakes, the envoys carrying carried their riches on donkeys' backs, their treasures on the humps of camels, to that unprofitable nation, to Egypt whose help is utterly useless. Therefore, I call her Rahab, the do-nothing. Go now, write it on a tablet for them, inscribe it on a scroll, that for the days to come it may be an everlasting witness. These are rebellious people, deceitful children, children unwilling to listen to Yahuwah's instruction. They say to the seers, see no more visions, and to the prophets, give us no more visions of what is right. Tell us pleasant things, Prophesy illusions, leave this way, get off this path, and stop confronting us with the set part one of Yashrael. Therefore, this is what the set part one of Yashrael says. Because you have rejected this message, relied on oppression, and depended on deceit, this sin will become for you like a high wall, cracked and, and bulging that collapses suddenly in an instant. It will break in pieces like pottery, shattered so mercilessly, that among its pieces not a fragment will be found for taking coals from a hearth or scooping water out of a cistern. This is what the Sovereign Almighty, the Set Apart One of Yashrael says, in repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength, but you would have none of it. You said, no, we will flee on horses, therefore you will flee. You said, we will ride off on swift horses, therefore your pursuers will be swift. A thousand will flee at the threat of one. At the threat of five, you will all flee away till you are left. Like a flagstaff on a mountaintop, like a banner on a hill. Yet Yahuwah longs to be gracious to you. He rises to show you compassion. 
For Yahuwah is an Elohim of justice. Baruch are all who wait for him. O people of Zion who live in Jerusalem, you will weep no more. How gracious he will be when you cry for help. As soon as he hears, he will answer you. Although Yahuwah gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, your teachers will be hidden no more. With your own eyes, you will see them. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Then you will defile your idols overlaid with silver and your images covered with gold. You will throw them away like a menstrual cloth and say to them, away with you. <laughs> he will also send you rain for the seed you sow in the ground. And the food that comes from the land will be rich and plentiful. In that day, your cattle will graze <clears throat> in broad meadows. The oxen and donkeys that work the soil will eat fodder <clears throat> and mash spread out with fork and shovel. In the day of great slaughter, when the towers fall, streams of water will flow on every high mountain and every lofty hill. The moon will shine like the sun, and the sunlight will be seven times brighter, like the light of seven full days, when Yahuwah binds up the bruises of his people and heals the wounds he inflicted. See the name of Yahuwah comes from afar, with burning anger and dense clouds of smoke. His lips are full of wrath, and his tongue is a consuming fire. His breath is like a rushing torrent rising up to the neck. He shakes the nations in the sleeve of destruction. He places in the jaws of the peoples a bit that leads them astray. And you will sing as on the night you celebrate a set-apart festival. Your hearts will rejoice as when people go up with flutes to the mountain of Yahuwah, to the rock of Yashrael. Yahuwah will cause men to hear his majestic voice and will make them see his arm coming down. With raging anger and consuming fire, with cloudburst, thunderstorm, and hail, the voice of Yahuwah will shatter Assyria. With his scepter, he will strike them down. Every stroke Yahuwah lays on them with his punishing rod, will be to the music of tambourines and harps. As he fights them in battle with the blows of his arm, Tophath has long been prepared and has been made ready for the king. Its fire pit has been made deep and wide with an abundance of fire and wood. The breath of Yahuwah, like a stream of burning sulfur, sets it ablaze. Chapter 31, and woe to those who go down to Egypt for help, who rely on horses, who trust in the multitude of their chariots and in the great strength of their horsemen. But do not look to the set apart one of Yashrael or seek help from Yahuwah. Yet he too is wise and can bring disaster. He does not take back his words. He will rise up against the house of the wicked against those who help evildoers. But the Egyptians are men and not Ali. Their horses are flesh and not spirit. When Yahuwah stretches out his hand, he who helps will stumble. He who is helped will fall. Both will perish together. This is what Yahuwah says to me. As a lion growls, a great lion over his prey, and though a whole band of shepherds is called together against him, he is not frightened by their shouts or disturbed by their clamor. So Yahuwah Almighty will come down to do battle on Mount Zion and on its heights. Like birds hovering overhead, Yahuwah Almighty will shield Jerusalem. He will shield it and deliver it. He will pass over it and will rescue it. Return to him. You have so greatly revolted against, O Yashrael, 
For in that day, every one of you will reject the idols of silver and gold your sinful hands have made. Assyria will fall by a sword that is not of man. A sword not of mortals will devour them. They will flee before the sword, and their young men will be put to forced labor. Their stronghold will fall because of terror. At sight of the battle, standard their commanders will panic, declares Yahuwah, whose fire is in Zion. Chapter 32. Okay, I'm sorry. Whose furnace is in Jerusalem. That was the end of 31. Okay. 32. See, a king will reign in righteousness, and rulers will rule with justice. Each man will be like a shelter from the wind, and a refuge from the storm, like streams of water in the desert, and the shadow of a great rock in a thirsty land. Then the eyes of those who see will no longer be closed, and the ears of those who hear will listen. The mind of the rash will know and understand, and the stammering tongue will be fluent and clear. No longer will the fool be called noble, nor the scoundrel be highly respected. For the fool speaks folly, his mind is busy with evil. He practices ungodliness and spreads error concerning Yahuwah. The hungry he leaves empty, and from the thirsty he withholds water. The scoundrel's methods are wicked. He makes up evil schemes to destroy the poor with lies, even when the plea of the needy is just. But the noble man makes noble plans, and by noble deeds he stands. You women who are so complacent, rise up and listen to me. You daughters who feel secure, hear what I have to say. In little more than a year, you who feel secure will tremble. The grape harvest will fail, and the harvest of fruit will not come. Tremble, you complacent women. Shudder, you daughters who feel secure. Strip off your clothes, put sackcloth around your waists, beat your breasts for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vines, and for the land of my people, a land overgrown with thorns and briars. Yes, mourn for all houses of merriment and for this city of revelry. The fortress will be abandoned, the noisy city deserted, Citadel and Watchtower will become a wasteland forever. The delight of donkeys, a pasture for flocks, till the spirit is poured upon us from on high. And the desert become a fertile field. And the fertile field seems like a forest. Justice will dwell in the desert and righteousness live in the fertile field. The fruit of righteousness will be peace. The effect of righteousness will be quietness and confidence forever. My people will live in peaceful dwelling places, in secure homes, in undisturbed places of rest. Though hail flattens the forest and the city is leveled completely, how marooned you will be, sowing your seed by every stream and lefting excuse me, and letting your oxen and donkeys range free. Chapter 33. <clears throat> Woe to you, O destroyer, you have, who have not been destroyed. Woe to you, O traitor, you who have not been betrayed. When you stop destroying, you will be destroyed. When you stop betraying, you will be betrayed. O oh, Master, be gracious to us, we long for you. Be our strength every morning, our salvation in time of distress. At the thunder of your voice, the peoples flee. When you rise up, the nations scatter. Your plunder, O oh, nations, is harvested as by young locusts, like a swarm of locusts men pounce on it. Yahuwah is exalted. For he dwells on high. 
He will fill Zion with justice and righteousness. He will be the sure foundation for your times, a rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. The fear of Yahuwah is the key to this treasure. Look, their brave men cry aloud in the streets. The envoys of peace weep bitterly. The highways are deserted. No travelers are on the roads. The treaty is broken. Its witnesses are despised. No one is respected. The land mourns and wastes away. Lebanon is ashamed and withers. Sharon is like the Arabah. The Bashan and Carmel drop their leaves. Now will I arise, says Yahuwah. Now will I be exalted. Now will I be lifted up. You conceive chaff. You give birth to straw. Your breath is a fire that consumes you. The peoples will be burned as if to wine. Like cut thorn bushes, they will be set ablaze. You who are far away, hear what I have done. You who are near, acknowledge my power. The sinners in Zion are terrified. Trembling grips the godless. Who of us can dwell with the consuming fire? Who of us can dwell with everlasting burning? He who walks righteously and speaks what is right, who rejects gain from extortion and keeps his hand from accepting bribes, who stops his ears against plots of murder and shuts his eyes against contemplating evil. This is the man who will dwell on the heights, whose refuge will be the mountain fortress. His bread will be supplied and water will not fail him. Your eyes will see the king in his beauty and view a land that stretches afar. In your thoughts, you will ponder the former terror. Where is that chief officer? Where is the one who took the revenue? Where is the officer in charge of the towers? You will see those arrogant people no more. Those people of an obscure speech with their strange, incomprehensible tongue. Look upon Zion, the city of our festivals. Your eyes will see Jerusalem, a peaceful abode, a tent that will not be moved. Its stakes will never be pulled up, nor any of its ropes broken. There, Yahuwah will be our mighty one. It will be like a place of broad rivers and streams. No galley with oars will ride them. No mighty ship will sail them. For Yahuwah is our judge. Yahuwah is our lawgiver. Yahuwah is our king. It is he who will save us. Your rigging hangs loose. The mast is not held secure. The sail is not spread. Then an abundance of spoils will be divided, and even the lame will carry off plunder. No one living in Zion will say, I am ill, and the sins of those who dwell there will be forgiven. Seer. So a lot of, I'm noticing at the end of chapter 31, there's a lot of day of his wrath language here. The name of Yahuwah burns as the day of wrath. Let's see. And his breath as rushing water in a valley shall reach as far as the neck. Uh, let's see here. Uh, rejoice must he go with the pipe as those that rejoice into the mountain of Yahuwah to the Elohim of Yashur all. Yahuwah shall make his steam voice to be heard and the wrath of his arm, which you could say uh, verse 30 is saying the wrath of Messiah 
to make a display with wrath and anger and devouring. Yet the um, verse 30 of 31 says the wrath of his arm. So I find that interesting, the wrath of his arm, which I don't think the Masoretic says that, which I'm not surprised. Um, I think it says a little bit different. It says, um, will make the splendor of his voice heard. So it's a little different, a little different. So the wrath of his arm, which obviously would mean wrath of Yahushua. <clears throat> so I find that interesting. Um, the Masoretic says splendor of his voice, which is a lot different. Uh, I don't know if the Son of Man Bible is paraphrasing there, but it seems like a lot different than the Septuagint. For at the voice of Yahuwah, Assyria will be shattered. Again, Assyria, the Assyrian. There's a lot of stuff we're going to see with the Assyrian here. And even earlier in this chapter, I definitely want to get into that. Um, Alihim has prepared for you a deep trench, wood pile of fire, a trench as a trench kindled with sulfur. So definitely a lot of stuff about hinting the destruction of the wicked. Okay, um, let me see here. I'm not going to retouch on chapter one my mom just read because I think all of us have read chapter one of Isaiah like a bunch of times. <laughs> Obviously, the context is they're rebellious children trying to keep the new moons, the feast days, but yet they want to be rebellious and basically go to a service once a week for Sabbath or... <laughs> Yeah, they want to yeah. offer it like it's yeah. penance of some kind. Yeah, so yeah. Like, go on their way, do their own yeah. thing. But, so. you know, when you think about it, things like offering animals mm -hmm. and doing things like that, those are physical things that, quite honestly, are very, are much easier to do than offering him your heart. Than by, offering by, him your own by the way, too, if you look at King Solomon's own writings, in Proverbs 15, it says, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to him. Mm -hmm. He's not even going to accept a sacrifice if we're living a horrible, extremely wicked lifestyle and, and we're just living in sin. He's not going to accept any type of sacrifice. Right. Whether physical, praise of the lips, he ain't going to accept anything. So that's Proverbs chapter 15. Well, so That's right. Um. Let me just see here. I want to go to verse 31 8. So I think that's the one that talks about the Assyrian here. Let's see here. And the Assyrian shall fall, not by a sword of a great man, nor the right. sword of a man. A mean man shall devour him. Neither shall he flee from the face of the sword, but the young men shall be overthrown. To me, this is linking, um, this is giving the same type of context that we talked about last week with Isaiah 27, verse 1, where it talks about Yahuwah in that day with his great sword, right, will punish the dragon. So, so there's, some, there's something in common this Assyrian character has with Satan mm. because Yahuwah's great sword in that day will destroy the dragon, but now it's saying here the Assyrian is going to be killed with a sword, but not a sword of a man. So pretty interesting there. Um, let's see here. Actually, I want to go to my Targum here, Targum of Isaiah here. Let's go to let's see if there's any things I want to get out of chapter 30. Let me see here. Okay, before we go to Chronicles. Whoa, okay. Oh, yeah, wow, okay. Oh, snap. All right, yeah, this this gives us confirmation about who the sword is. In the Targum of Isaiah 30, verse 31, it reads, For through the voice of the word of Yahuwah, the Assyrian shall be broken. He that smote by his power. So according to the Targum of Isaiah in verse 31 of chapter 30, 
it says the word of Yahuwah is the one that's breaking the Assyrian. That is very interesting. Which we kind of see a foreshadowing of this when Sennacherib and the Assyrians try to invade Israel back in the time of, I think in the time of Isaiah, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. when they took the northern house and the angel of Yahuwah withstood him, didn't allow them to get into the land. So a lot of people that want to say, oh, the Assyrians and Necro. No, no, it's not because they never actually came into Israel. Um, and if you're not familiar with that concept, I would, I'm just going to put in a little cheap plug here. Um, we did a study called who is the Assyrian yeah. uh, study. We did uh, um, last year where I had, I shared a video from Chuck Missler on a part of that study where he talks about the whole history uh, of it and how Sennacherib was like a foreshadowing of this person called the Assyrian and how the angel of Yahuwah, AKA Yahusha. So there's like a, a foreshadowing battle there and how the angel of Yahuwah is the person that kills 185,000 men. So Yahusha in his pre-incarnate, you know, self did that. Um, he killed 185,000 humans and uh, Sennacherib was stopped in his tracks and wasn't even able to get into the land of Israel at that point in time, which, by the way, if he was the Assyrian in prophecy, he would to fulfill that. He has to go into the land of Israel because Micah says that the land, the Assyrians shall tread in our land, mm -hmm. meaning the land of Israel, which Sennacherib never actually did. He never actually got into the land. So just thought I would put my two cents of that. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. And it shall come to pass to cause rest to rest the vengeance of his might in every pass of their princes, mighty ones, even amongst them. The house of Yashrael shall praise with tabrets hearts because of the mighty war. Uh, for Sheol is me. Now, this is interesting. This, I believe, is also talking about the Assyrian here. Another prophetic thing here in verse 33 of the same chapter. For Sheol is made ready from eternity on account of their sins. Interesting. So it's very similar to how in Isaiah 14, right? Yahuwah is talking to this person, Halel, who is mistranslated as Lucifer. He says, Sheol beneath is ready to meet you. Um, so in Isaiah 30, 33, it says, For Sheol is made ready from eternity on account of their sins. Yea, the eternal king has prepared it deep and wide. So this is actually saying, Yahuwah, Yahusha has prepared Sheol deep and wide. <clears throat> Higher as abundance of fuel burns in it. The word of Yahuwah, like an overwhelming torrent of brimstone, shall kindle it. So that's interesting. So we see here, even in the Targum's belief system, they have this idea that there's a bad side of Sheol, right? But it's not the lake of fire, but there's still a fiery gulf, like Yahusha mentions, that the um, wicked are technically in some type of torment because we if you look at the story of Lazarus and the rich man mm -hmm. Lazarus goes to the Abraham's bosom part of Sheol down under the earth in Sheol and he's fine he's he's comforted he's fine he's asleep but he's in peace and then you have the wicked on the other side of Sheol where there's there's a little bit of torment there it seems they're like they're like you know there there's a fiery gulf fixed you know <laughs> So I believe the Targum of Isaiah in 30, verse 33, is actually talking about that. It says the word of Yahuwah prepared it that way, which is interesting. Um, so I find that interesting enough. So <clears throat> let's see here. Chapter 31, we already talked about the Assyrian. Da, 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 da. Oh, verse 4 is pretty interesting of chapter 31. For thus Yahuwah has said unto me, like as the lion and the lion's whelp roar over their prey, when a multitude of shepherds are come together, he will not be afraid of their voice, neither be terrified at their tumult. <laughs> thus shall the kingdom of Yahuwah of armies be revealed, 
surrounding upon the Mount of Zion and upon its hill. As a bird by flying, so shall the power of Yahuwah of armies shall be revealed. He shall protect, he shall deliver, he shall save, he shall make to pass away. Um, verse 6 to me was pretty important. It says here, I don't think it's like this in the other versions of Isaiah 31, 6. It says, return to the law, for you have multiplied sin, O sons of Yasharal. Um, at, that at that time, each man shall abhor the idols of their silver and the idols of their gold, which your hands have made for you for a deity. And we just talked about the Assyrian before. Um, we talked about, you know, self-explanatory 32 verse 1, who the righteous king would be. Obviously, that's Yahushua. Okay, a righteous king shall reign. Um, you know, Yahushua is even called um, Yahuwah or righteousness in other places in Jeremiah. Okay. Um, let's see here. And the righteous that were hidden because of the wicked as those who hide themselves on account of a storm shall return and shall be magnified. Their instruction shall be received quickly like the waters that flow into a dry land. So it's a lot of more prophetic language here comparing people to water. Okay. Like the shadow of a great rock in a parched land and the eyes of the righteous shall not be shut and the ears of those who receive instruction shall hear. Even the heart of the rash shall understand knowledge and the tongue of those that was tied shall be ready to speak plainly. And the wicked man shall no more be called <laughs> righteous. So this is talking about no more partiality in verse five here. Um, and, and he that transgresses against his word, meaning against the word of Yahuwah, shall not be called mighty. For the wicked shall talk wickedness, and in their heart they shall meditate violence to practice falsehood, to speak revolt against Yahuwah, to weary the soul of the righteous who long after instruction as the hungry after bread. What does that sound like? Longs <laughs> for the word or the Torah as after bread. Hmm. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word, the, the father that proceeds out of the father's mouth. To me, that seems what the Targum of Isaiah is saying here. It's kind of like they're paraphrasing that concept. Who long after instruction as the hungry after bread and after the words of the law, which are like water to him, that is thirsty. Yeah, that was very interesting. They purpose to make to cease. And the wicked whose works are evil to counsel with sinners to destroy the poor with lying words and the words of the needy and right ruling. But the righteous counsel truth and their truth they shall be established. Okay, see if anything else really stood out to me from this chapter before we're going to 33 here. Um, searched out in these time. Glad this king is because of spoil for armies. I think that's about it for 32. Um, see, first, or so chapter 33. That verse two was interesting. Oh, Yahuwah, be merciful unto us, for we have trusted for your word. And they put word in all caps here because it's talking about Yahusha. Be thou our strength every day, our salvation also in the time of distress. At the voice of the of tumultuous noise, the people are afraid on account of the multitude of mighty actions. Kingdoms are scattered. Verse 5, I thought was interesting. Mighty is Yahuwah who makes his splendor to dwell in the highest heavens. Who has promised to fill Sion with them that do right ruling and righteousness. Notice the concept of those that keep his commandments will be in Zion. It's pretty interesting. That's like a foreshadowing of the heavenly Jerusalem there. Um, and it shall come to pass whatever good you have promised them that fear you. You will bring and establish it in its time, strength and salvation, wisdom and knowledge. For them that fear you who are the treasure of his togeness is prepared. Um, when you shall reveal yourself to them. We just talked about this last night. We're going to be reading this later in First John. Like we will see him as he is. So I kind of find it interesting. It says you will reveal yourself to them. 
The messengers of the nation shall cry bitterly in the street. Those who had gone forth to proclaim peace shall return to weep in bitterness of soul. Um, uh, let's see. Now I, verse 10. Now I will reveal myself, says Yahuwah. Now I will lift myself up on high. Now I will be exalted. Yea, O people, or yea, O people, have purpose for yourselves, purpose of lawlessness. You have worked for yourself evil works because your works are evil. My word shall consume you. So this is 33 verse 10 in the Targum of Isaiah. My word shall consume you as a whirlwind consumes chaff. And then it talks about the burning of the fire in the furnace. Righteous that hear ye, verse 13, O righteous that keep the law from of old, what I have done. And know ye, ye sinners that have returned to my law, that my strength is near. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Terror has seized the wicked, who, when they were committing theft in their ways, said, who of us shall dwell in Zion in which the brightness of his splendor? Remember how it says in the second, what is it, mom? Second Thessalonians chapter two mm-hmm. talks about the brightness of Yahushua's coming and all that. Mm-hmm. So that's interesting. The brightness of his splendor is like devouring fire. Who of us shall sojourn in Jerusalem where the wicked shall be judged? to be delivered into Sheol, into, yeah, this probably hell is not supposed to be here. Uh, I think the translator messed up here. Yeah, yeah, it probably should be Gehenna here. Uh, To be delivered into Gehenna, into everlasting burning. Yeah, that's obviously talking about Gehenna, not Sheol or hell. Um, Sometimes these translators, they have a preconceived bias with some of these English translations. (laughs) Anyway, moving on. The prophet said, the righteous shall live in it. Everyone who walks in righteousness and speaks honest things, removing himself to a distance from the mammon of lawlessness. Interesting, money of lawlessness. Removing himself from oppressions that restrain his hands from holding a bribe that stops his ears from hearing of the shedding of innocent blood um, and shuts his eyes from looking at the workers of lawlessness. Okay. Verse 17, your eyes shall see the splendor of the king of the worlds in his beauty. You shall behold and see those that descend down to Sheol. Interesting. Um, your heart shall meditate great things. Where are, I really like this verse here. This stood out to me from this chapter. Where are the scribes? Where are the rulers? Where are the mathematicians? Let them come if they are able to count the number of the slain of the chief of the camp of the mighty, you shall not be able to see the government of a mighty people whose language is so unintelligible that you cannot understand it. Whose tongue stammers because there is no understanding in them. O Zion, you shall see their fall. O city of our festivals. Interesting. Your eyes shall see the consolation of Jerusalem and her prosperity and security like a tabernacle that is not taken down, whose pegs are not drawn out forever, whose cords shall not be broken. Yea, surely from there, the power of Yahuwah shall be revealed to do tobe unto us from the place where overflowing rivers of broad span shall flow, through which shall not pass the fisherman's boat, nor the large boats go through it. Okay, talking about bringing us out of Egypt. You who is our king, he redeemed <laughs> us. Okay, Let's see if there's anything different here. Um, trying to the people, each other about the bonus. Okay, um, last verse of 33 here. Henceforth, they shall not say to the people which dwell round about them, I shall return to the splendor from you is come upon us the evil. The people. The, the people, the house of Yashorah shall be gathered together and they shall return to their land, their sins being forgiven. So again, that alludes back to how Yahuwah talks about in that day, I will blot out your sins. Okay. So yeah, a lot of interesting stuff in Isaiah here. A lot of millennial talk, a lot of um, 
<laughs> second exodus being referenced there at the end of that chapter the greater exodus so very interesting so we're now going to be going to a new reader here i think we'll stay on this recording because it was only people oh go ahead brother joshua um, I just had a couple points I wanted to touch on. Um, one was uh, uh, going back to Isaiah 1, 20 and 21. Um, in the Masoretic verses, the Septuagint. Um, give me just a second. Isaiah 1. So the Septuagint, it reads um, in verses 20 through 21, um, but if you be not willing, nor hearken to me, a sword shall devour you, for the mouth of Yahuwah has spoken this. How has the faithful city Zion, once full of judgment, become a harlot, wherein righteousness lodged, but now murderers? When you go to the... Huh. I must have wrote that down wrong. That's uh, that's the wrong, wrong one. I got the wrong number down. I'll co- have to come back to that another time. Um, but the verses, um, chapter two, verse eight. In the um, Septuagint, it reads, "And the land is filled with abominations, even the works of their hands, and they have worshipped." They have worshipped the works which their fingers made. Mm. Give me a second. Yeah, no problem. My notes are really off. It happens to me a lot. I forget the verse. see while joshua's finding that i'm gonna set us up for the chronicles portion right now and um here we can just move on i'll come back come back to this when we're done because i must have wrote down a lot of the wrong numberings all right um I think what we're going to do is we're going to combine Chronicles with this recording because there's no other category I can really separate Chronicles into. So we're going to consider that as like part of the prophets. Um, so first Chronicles 6 to 11, I think uh, brother, brother Joshua, we're going to go with you. And then Dennis will do the Brit Hadashah New Covenant portion to uh close us out for today so if you're able to just let me know um to do uh first chronicles 6 to 11 me or brother dennis uh you you brother oh yeah i I got it you said first chronicles 6 to 11 yes So I'm coming out of the LXXE, like some Septuagint. Um, just a second. So the sons of Lewi, Gedson, Kahath, and Moirari, and the sons of Kahath, Ambram, uh, this first Chronicles six, um, and the sons of Kahath, Ambram, and Is- Isar, Hebron, and Oziel, and the sons of Ambram, Aran, and Masha, and Miriam, and the sons of Aran, Nadab, and Abiud, Eleazar, and Ithmar. Eleazar begot Phineas, Phineas begot Abisu, Abisu begot Boki, and Boki begot Ozi, Ozi begot Zariah, Zariah begot Mariel. And Maria begat Amarai, uh, Amaraya, and Amaraya begat Ak- Akitob, and Akitob begat Zadok, and Zadok begat Akimas, and Akimas begat Azarias, and Azarias begat Yohanan, and Yohanan begat Azarias. He ministered as a priest, 
in the house which Shlomo built in Yerushalayim. And Azariah begat Amariah, and Amariah begat Akitob, and Akitob begat Zadok, and Zadok begat Shalom, and Shalom begat Kelsias, and Kelsias begat Azariah, and Azariah begat Sariah, and Sariah begat Yasadak. And Yosadak went into captivity with Yehuda and Yerushalayim under Nebuchadnezzar. The sons of Levi, Gadson, Ka, and Merari. And these are the names of the sons of Gadson, Lobini and Semai, the sons of Kahath, Ambram, and Isar, Kebron, and Aziel. The sons of Merari, Muli, and Musi. And these are the families of Levi, according to their families. To Gadson, Tolobini, his son, were born Yath, his son, Zamat, his son, Yoab, his son, Adi, his son, Zarar, his son, Yathri, his son, the sons of Gahath, Aminadab, his son, Kor, his son, Asur, his son, Elkanah, his son, Abisaf, his son, Asur, his son, Saat, his son, Uriel, his son, Oziah, his son, Shaul, his son, and the sons of Hilkanah, Amasi and Akimoth, Hilkanah, his son, Sufai, his son, Enath, his son, Aliab, his son, Jeroboam, his son, Hilkanah, his son, the sons of son Samuel, the firstborn, Sani, and Abia, the sons of Merari, Muli, Lobini, his son, Samai, his son, Aza, his son, Sama, his son, and Gia, his son, Isaiah, his son. And these whom Dawood set over the servants of the singers in the house of Yahuwah when the ark was at rest. And they ministered in front of the tabernacle of witness on instruments until Shalomo built the house of Yahuwah in Yerushalayim. And they stood according to their order for their services. And these that stood and their sons and the sons of Kahat, uh, Amon, the psalm singer, son of Yoel, the son of Samuel, the son of Elkanah, the son of Jeroboam, the son of Elial, the son of Toaz, the son of Toaz, the son of Shuv, the son of Elkanah, the son of Maat, the son of Amati, the son of Elkanah, the son of Yoel, the son of Azarias, the son of Yaphanias, the son of Tahat, the son of Asur, the son of Labiasaf, the son of Kor, the son of Yisar, the son of Kahat, the son of Levi, the son of Yashadal, and his brother Asaph, who stood at his right hand. Asaph, the son of Borakias, the son of Sama, the son of uh, Michael, the son of Baasia, the son of Melkiah, the son of Batani, the son of Zarai, the son of Badai, the son of Batam, the son of Zaman, the son of Semai, the son of Jiath, the son of Getson, the son of Levi. And the sons of Merari, their brethren on the left hand. Athan, the son of Kisad, the son of Abai, the son of Malak, the son of Asebi, the son of Amasias, the son of Baani, the son of Samur, the son of Muli, the son of Musi, the son of Morari, the son of Levi. And their brethren, according to the houses of their fathers, the Levites, who were appointed to all the work of ministration of the tabernacle of the house of Yahuwah. And Aaron and his sons were to burn incense on the altar of whole burnt offerings and on the altar of incense. For all the ministry in the set apart of set aparts, and to make atonement for Yasharal, according to all things that Masha the servant of Yahuwah commanded. And these are the sons of Aaron, Eleazar his son, Phineas his son, Abisu his son, Balki his son, Ozi his son, Sariah his son, Mariel his son, Amaria his son, Akitob his son, Zadok his son, Akimas his son, and these are their residents in their villages, in their coasts, to the sons of Badan, to their family, the Kaathites, for they had the lot. And they gave them Hebron in the land of Yehuda and its suburbs round about it. But the fields of the city and its villages they gave to Caleb, the son of Yephoni. And to the sons of Aran, they gave the cities of refuge, Hebron and Labna, and her suburbs round about, and Selma, and her suburbs, and Estamo, and her suburbs, and Yathar, and her suburbs, 
and the beard and her suburbs and a son and her suburbs and Bayet Samis and her suburbs and of the tribe of Binyamin, Dubai and her suburbs and Galamoth and her suburbs and Anathoth and her suburbs. And all their cities were 13 cities according to their families. And to the sons of Ka'ath that were left of their families, given out of the tribe, out of the half tribe of Manashe, by lot, 10 cities. And to the sons of Gadson, according to their families, given 13 cities of the tribe of Issachar, of the tribe of Ashur, of the tribe of Naphtali, of the tribe of Manashe, and Basan. And to the sons of Murari, according to their families, by lot, 12 cities of the tribe of, tribe of Ribbon, uh, well, 12 cities of the tribe of Reuben, of the tribe of Gad, of the tribe of Zebulun, so the children of Yashorol gave to the Levites the cities in their suburbs, and they gave by lot out of the tribe of the children of Yehuda, and out of the tribe of the children of Simeon, and out of the tribe of the children of Benjamin, these cities which they call by name. And to the members of the families of the sons of Kahath, they were also given the cities of their borders out of the tribe of Ephraim. And they gave them the cities of refuge, Sikkim and her suburbs in Mount Ephraim and Gezer and her suburbs, and Yekma'an and her suburbs, and Beethoron and her suburbs, and Elon and her suburbs, and Gethramon and her suburbs, and of the half tribe of Manashe, Anar and her suburbs, and Yemblam and her suburbs, to the sons of Kahat that were left, according to each several family. To the sons of Gedson from the families of the half tribe of Manashe, Golan of Basan and her suburbs, and Asarath and her suburbs, and out of the tribe of Issachar, Kedes and her suburbs, and Debedi and her suburbs, and Debor and her suburbs, and Ramoth and Anon and her suburbs, and of the tribe of Ashur, Masal uh, and her suburbs, and Abda and her suburbs, and Akat and her suburbs, and Rube and her suburbs, and the tribe of Naphtali, Kedez and Galilee, and in her suburbs, and Kamoth and her suburbs, and Kariathi, theme and her suburbs, to the sons of Merari that were left, out of the tribe of Zebulun, Ramon and her suburbs, and Tabor and her suburbs, out of beyond Jordan, Jericho westway, westward of Jordan, out of the tribe of Reuben, Basur in the wilderness and her suburbs, and Yasa and her suburbs, and Kadmoth and her suburbs, and Meifla and her suburbs, out of the tribe of God, Ramoth, Galaad and her suburbs, um, Manim and her suburbs, and Esbon and her suburbs, and Yazar and her suburbs. First Chronicles chapter seven. And as to the sons of Yisachar, Tola and Pua, and Yasub and Simeron four, and the sons of Tola, Ozi, Raphaya, and Yariel, excuse me, and Yemai and Yemason and Samuel, chiefs of their father's houses, belonging to Tola, men of might, according to their generations. Their number in the days of Daud was twenty and two thousand and six hundred. And the sons of Ozi, Yezariah, and the sons of Yezariah, Mikael. Uh, Abdiu and Yoel and Josiah, five all rulers, and with them according to their generations, according to the houses of their families, were men mighty to set armies in array for war, thirty and six thousand, for they had multiplied their wives and children, and their brethren among all the families of Issachar, also mighty men, were eighty-seven thousand. This was the number of them all. The sons of Benjamin, Baal and Bakir and Yadiel, three. And the sons of Baal, Ishbon, and Ozi, and Uziel, and Yarmuth, and Uri, five heads of houses of families, mighty men, and their number was 20 in 2034. And the sons of Bekir, Zimura, and Yoaz, and Eleazar, and Elathenan, and Amariah, and Yarmuth, and Abiud, and Anathoth, and Elimith, all these are the sons of Bekir. And their number according to their generations, they were chiefs of their father's houses, men of might, was 20,200. And the sons of Jediel, Balaan, and the sons of Balaan, Yaus, and Benjamin, and Eoth, and Kanana, 
and Zethon and Tarsi and Akisar, all these are the sons of Uriel, uh, chiefs of their families, men of might, 17,200 17, going forth to war with might. And Safin and Afin and the sons of Ur, Asom was son, whose son was Aor, the sons of Naphtali, Yaziel, Goni, and Asher, Selam, his sons, Balaam, his son, the sons of Manasseh, Asriel, whom his Syrian concubine bore, and she bore to him also Makir, the father of Galaad. And she bore to him also Makir, the father of Galaad. And Makir took a wife for Lafin and Safin, and his sister's name was Muka. And the name of the second was Sufa'ad, and to Sufa'ad were born daughters. And Muka, the wife of Makir, bore a son, and called his name Parez, and his brother's name was Surus. His sons were Ulam and Rokam, and the sons of Ulam, Badam. These were the sons of Galaad, the sons of Makir, the son of Manasseh. And his sister Malekith bore Yesud and Abiezer and Maale, and the sons of Samir were Aim and Sakim and Lakim and Anian, and the sons of Ephraim Solaat and Barad his son and Taath his son, Alada his son, Saath his son, and Zabad his son, Sotheli his son, and Ezer and Aliad, and the men of Gath who were born in the land slew them because they went down to take their cattle. And they father, and their father Ephraim mourned many days, and his brethren came to comfort him. And he went into his wife, and she conceived and bore a son, and called his name Beriah, because said he, he was afflicted in my house. And his daughter was Sodah, and he was among them that were left, and he built a Beethron, the upper and the lower. And the descendants of Ozan were Siada and Rafi, his sons, Sodah and Talias, his sons. And Tahian, his son, Teladan, his son was born, his son, Amiud, his son, Alisomai, his son, Nun, his son, Yahusha, these were his sons. And their possession and their dwelling were Bethel, and her towns to the east, Noran, westward, Gazer, and her towns, and Shechem, and her towns, as far as Gaza, and her towns. And as far as the borders of the sons of Manasseh, Bayes, Sa'an, and her towns, Tanakh, and her towns, Megiddo and her towns, Dor and her towns. In this, the children of Yosef, the son of Yashua, dwelt. The sons of Yashur, Yimna, and Siwiya, and Iswi, and Bariah, and Sor, their sister. And the sons of Bariah, Kerber, and Melchiel. He was the father of Barthai. And Herber begat Yaflet, and Samur, and Kothan, and Sola, their sister. And the sons of Yeflet, Basek and Bamael and Asid, these are the sons of Yeflet. And the sons of Simur, Akir and Ruga and Yaba and Elam. And the sons of Elam, his brother, Sofa and Imana and Salais and Imal. The sons of Sofa, Su and Arnafar and Sula and Barin and Imran. And Bashan and Oa and Sama and Salisa and Yasra and Biara. And the sons of Yasser, Yefina, and Faspa, and Ara, and the sons of Ola, Orek, Aniel, and Rasia. All these are the sons of Ashur, all heads of families, choice, mighty men, chief leaders, the number for battle array. Their number was 26,000 men. First Chronicles chapter 8. Now, Binyamin begot Baal, uh, his firstborn. And Ashbel, his second son, Adah the third, Noah the fourth, and Rapha the fifth. Before I go on with chapter eight, um, I just had a question. Verses seven, or chapter seven, verses 20 through 21, um, where it's talking about, and the sons of Ephraim, Sothalath, and Barad, his son, and Ta'ath, 
his son, Elada his son, Sa'af his son, and Zabad his son, Sotheli his son, and Azur and Eliad. And the men of Gath who were born in the land slew them because they went down to take their cattle. Um, are these, I don't remember where I read it or if it was just commentary and if the commentary was false, but were these men that had fled, uh, had fled Mitzrayim before Yahuwah delivered them out? Yeah. Yeah, this, this might be actually proving the commentary correctly, if I'm reading this correctly. This would actually prove the pseudo-Jonathan Targum to be correct then, because the pseudo-Jonathan actually says that the Ephraim, um, according to them, the dry bones is actually the Ephraimites of the Exodus that left before it was their appointed time to leave with the children of Israel. So, and we see in this chapter you just read um, that you brought up, it says that they were slewed by Gath. According to pseudo Jonathan, it says the same thing. It says that the Ephraimites, um, they, be they believe that the Ephraimites that are the dry bones were slewed by Gath when they went down there. So according to the Septuagint, even it's kind of actually paralleling with pseudo Jonathan of Exodus. What is it? 13. Exodus 13, where it talks about these are the dry bones, the ones that fled before their appointed time. They went down to Gath to make war and they were killed. Um, Yahuwah did not bring them that way because they didn't want to fear seeing the bones of their brothers. Um, so it seems like pseudo Jonathan might have a point there um, with his commentary. He might actually know some history there that actually happened. Um, so that that's something that's interesting. I might want to take a note of that. It's uh, Exodus like 13, 17. Let me see if I can find that in my Kindle because the first time I showed the group this, it was from my Kindle here. Let me see here. Da, 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 da. I believe it's either Exodus 13 or 14 of the Targum Pseudo Jonathan. Uh, okay, hold on. All right, a little too, a little too far there. Okay. Um, let's see here. Let's see. Okay, here we go. Let's see here. Yeah, here we go. Just to read back what Brother Joshua was saying here, it says, uh, 1317 of the Targum Pseudo Jonathan of Exodus. And it was when Pharaoh had released people that Yahuwah did not conduct them by the way of the land of the Philistines, Gath, that was near uh, one. For Yahuwah said, lest the people be frightened and see their brothers who were killed in war, 200,000 men of strength of the tribe of Ephraim who took shields and lances and weapons of war went down to Gath and carried off flocks of the uh, Philistines. And because they transgressed against the statute of the word of Yahuwah and went forth from Mitzrayim three years before the appointed end of their servitude, they were delivered into the hand of the Philistines who slew them. These are the dry bones, which the word of Yahuwah restored to life by the ministry of the hand of Ezekiel, the prophet in the Valley of Dura, but which if they now saw them, they would be afraid and return into Egypt. So basically, Jonathan, uh, well, I don't, we don't know who really wrote this because it's pseudo means falsely attributed. So we, we don't know who wrote this Targum, but it's interesting to know what Joshua just read in First Chronicles uh, chapter 7 seems to agree uh, historically with what this expounding of the pseudo Jonathan is talking about in Exodus 13. So very interesting. Um, very interesting. And, and if that's true, then we have a parallel between the, the Targum of Exodus 13, verse 17, and First Chronicles 7. So I'm going to make a little note there. So, and that, let me check the particular verse just so I write this cross reference down here. So that'd be First Chronicles 7, 17. 
and the Targum Pseudo Jonathan of Exodus 13 17. Which, by the way, it's not a contradiction what it's saying there in the Targum, because if you read Ezekiel for yourself, they were brought back to life at that point in time. It's only through man made tradition we thought were the dry bones. There's no actual verse in Ezekiel. Um, in the dry bones chapter of, I think it's either 36 or 37. Um, there's no actual verse there that even hints that it's a future prophecy about the dry bones coming back to life. Um, as far as the ministry of Ezekiel, where you tells them to breathe on the dry bones and they, and they come to life. It, even, even if you just look at Ezekiel, it's worded that way where it's like happening when Ezekiel's doing that. So Anyway, great point, Brother Joshua. That, that was a good point to bring out. So there seems to be a backing to that assertion of Ephraim dying there. So that's interesting. So the sons of Ephraim. Okay. Oh, my bad. It's not verse 17. It's verse 20. Okay, so chapter 7, verse 20. The sons of Ephraim. Because they went down to take, yeah, it even says it there. They went down to take their cattle. Huh. Interesting. Okay. So I'm gonna let Brother Joshua take back over, um, if and see if he has anything he wants to add before he uh, continues in chapter eight. I'll mute myself here. Well, I'm gonna keep going. I knew you. I was busy trying to figure out my notes here man like they're just i don't know what happened there but well um and so verses four uh first chronicles eight verse four i think is where we left off um so and abishua and naman and ahoa and gera and shehufan and huram and these are the sons of ehud these are the heads of the fathers of the inhabitants of Geba, and they removed them to Manath Manahat and Naman and Ahia and Gera. He removed them and begot Uzzah and Ahihud and Shaharaim begot children in the country of Moab after he had sent them away. Ushim and Borah were his wives and he begot of Hodesh his wife, Yobab and Zibia and Misha and Malcam and Yauz and Shakia and Mirma. These are his sons, heads of the fathers, and of Ushim he begot Abitub and Elpal and the sons of Elpal, Eber, Eber and Misham and Shamed, who built Ono and Lod with the towns thereof, and Buriah also and Shema, who were heads of the fathers of the inhabitants of Ajilan, who drove away the inhabitants of Gath, and Ahiho, Shishak, and Yeramot, and Zebediah, and Elad, and Adar, and Mikael. And Ishba, Ishba and Yoha, the sons of Beriah, and Zabadiah, and Meshuram, and Hezekiah, and Hebar, Ishmirai also, and Yuzliah, and Yobab, the sons of El Paal, and Yakim, and Zikri, and Zabdai, and Eliani, and Zithai, and Eliel, and Adiah, and Beriah, and Shimrat, the sons of Shimhi. And Ishpan and Eber and Eliel and Abdon and Zikri and Hanan and Hananiah and Alam and Atathia and Ephedia and Pinuel, the sons of Shishak. And I just want to point this out for anybody that might be out there watching, watching Pinuel or Pinuel is not your pineal gland. Um, there's no connection there. Um, Verse 26, and Shem Shaddai and Shehariah and Athaliah and Yerusiah and Eliah and Zikri, the sons of Yeroham. These are heads of the fathers by their generations, chief men, these dwelt in Yerushalayim. And at Gibeon dwelt the father of Gibeon, whose wife's name was Maaka, and his firstborn son, Abdon and Zer and Kish and Baal and Nadab and Gedor and Ahio and Zakir. And Miklat begot Shimia, and these also dwelt with their brethren in Yerushalayim over against them. And Ner begot Kish, and Kish begot Shaul, and Shaul begot Yonathan, 
and Malkiel, Shua, and Abinadab, and Ishbaal. Interesting that he named his last son Baal. And the son of Jonathan was Mary Baal. Oh, wow, well, he did the same thing. It was Marie Baal, and Marie Baal begot Micah. And the sons of Micah were Pithon, and Melech, and Taria, and Ahaz. And Ahaz begot Ye Yehoda, and Yehoda uh, begot Elameth. And I wonder if that's the same word as Yehuda, Yehoda. Um, and Asmaveth and Zimri and Zimri begot Maza and Maza begot Binya. Rapha was his son, Eliash, uh, Eliasa his son, Azel his son, and Azel had six sons, whose names are these, Azrikam, Bokeru, and Ishmael, and Shiraya, and Obadiah, and Hanan. All these were the sons of Azel. And the sons of Ishek, his brother, were Ulam, his firstborn, Yahush the second, and Eliphalet the third. And the sons of Ulam were mighty men of valor, archers, and had many sons, and sons' sons, and hundred and fifty. All these are the sons of Benjamin. First Chronicles chapter 9. So all Yasharal was reckoned by genealogies, and behold, they were written in the book of the kings of Yasharal and Yehuda, who were carried away to Babylon for their transgression. Now the first inhabitants that dwelt in their possessions and their cities were the Yashralites, the priests, Levites, and the Nethanines. How did I get on that? Sorry, somehow it switched over to the uh, King James. Um, let me read that verse in chapter two. King James reads it as Nethanim, but um, Septuagint says appointed ones. And they that dwelt before in their possessions in the cities of Yashural, the priests, the Levites, and the appointed ones. And there dwelt in Yerushalayim some of the children of Yehuda, and of the children of Benjamin, and of the children of Ephraim, and Manasseh, and Ganothi, and the son of Samiud, the son of Amrai, the son of Amblaim, the son of Buni, the son of sons of Paraz, the son of Yehuda, and of the Salonite, Asaiah, his firstborn, and his son. By the sons of Zarah, Yael, and their brethren, 690. And the sons of Benjamin, Shalom, son of Masolam, son of Aduai, son of Asinu. And Yimna, son of Yerobam, and Elo, these are the sons of Bozi, the son of Mekir, and Mosolam, son of Safatia, son of Raguel, son of Yemnaya, and their brethren according to to their generations, 956. All the men were heads of families according to the houses of their fathers. And of the priests, Yodai and Yoalim and Yakin, and Azariah, the son of Kelsiah, the son of Mosolam, the son of Zadok, the son of Mario, the son of Akitob, the ruler of the house of Yahuwah. And Adiah, son of Yeram, son of Baskur, son of Melchiah, and Maasiah, son of Adiel, son of Ezira, son of Mosulam, son of Masalmoth, son of Emer, and their brethren, chiefs of the families, 1,760, mighty men for the work of the ministration of the house of Yahuwah. And in the Levites, Samiah, son of Asob, son of Azrakam, son of Asabiah, of the sons of Merari, and Bakar, and Arez, and Galaa, and Mataniah, son of Mikah, son of Zechri, son of Asaf, and Abdiah, Son of Samia, son of Gaal, uh, Galaal, son of Idutun, and Berakiah, son of Osa, son of Elkanah, who dwelt in the villages of the uh, Nophetites, doorkeepers, Shalom, Akum, Telmon, and Demon, and their brethren. Shalom was the chief. And he waited hitherto in the king's gate eastward. These are the gates of the companies of the sons of Levi. And Salom, the son of Korah, the son of Abiasaf, the son of Korah, and his brethren belonging to the house of his father. The Korahites were over the works of the service, keeping the watches of the tabernacle and their fathers over the camp of Yahuwah, keeping their entrance. And Phineas, son of Eleazar, was head over them before Yahuwah, and these were with him. Zacharias, the son of Masolami, was keeper of the door of the tabernacle of witness. All the chosen porters in the gates were 212. These were in the courts 
This was in their distribution. These, Daud and Samuel, the seer, established in their charge. And these and their sons were over the gates in the house of Yahuwah and in the house of the tabernacle to keep watch. The gates were toward the four winds, eastward, westward, northward, and southward. And their brethren were in the courts to enter in weekly from time to time with these. Four strong men had the charge of the gates, and the Levites were over the chambers. Four strong men had the charge of the gates, and the Levites were over their chambers, and they keep watch over the treasures of the house of Yahuwah. For the charge was upon them, and these were charged with the keys to open the doors of the temple every morning. And some of them were appointed over the vessels of service, that they should carry them in by number and carry them out by number. And some of them were appointed over their furniture and over all the set-apart vessels and over the fine flour, the wine, the oil, the frankincense, and the spices. And some of the priests were makers of the ointment and appointed to prepare the spices. And Mattathiah of the Levites, he was over the firstborn of Shalom, the Korite, was set in charge of the sacrifices of meat offering and the pan belonging to the high priests. And Banias, the Kaathite from among their brethren, was set over the showbread to prepare it every Shabbat. And these are the singers, heads of families of the Levites, to whom were established daily courses, for they were employed in the services day and night. These were the heads of the families of the Levites according to their generations. These chiefs dwelt in Yerushalayim, and Yael, the father of Gabaon, dwelt in Gabaon, and his wife's name was Moroka. And his firstborn son was Adon, and he had Sir, and Kis, and Baal, and Ner, and Adab, and Gedur, and his brother, and Zakur, and Makalav. And Makaloth begat Sama, and these dwelt in the midst of their brethren in Yerushalayim, even in their midst of their brethren. And Ner begat Kis, and Kis begat Shaul, and Shaul begat Jonathan, and Melchisu, and Aminadab, and Asabal. And the son of Jonathan was Meribaal, and Meribaal begat Micah. And the sons of Micah were Pithon, and Malak, and Tarak, and Akaz begat Yahuda, uh, Yada, and Yada begat Galamath, and Gazmoth, and Zambri, and Zambri begat Masa, and Masa begat, uh, begat Bana. And Raphael was his son, Elasa his son, Isel his son. And Isel had six sons, and these were their names, Esrakam his firstborn, and Ismael, and Sariah, and Abdiya, and Anon, and Asa. These were the sons of Isel. I wonder if it's just a translation issue, or if it's um, just like messing up the word, like over time but i noticed like a lot of the times it'll say like son of son of son of and then other times it'll say his son his son his son it like varies widely when reading the septuagint yeah it doesn't keep a constant terminology <clears throat> yeah i wonder um either 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 breton got really tired <laughs> of writing the same thing or or all these genealogies he probably just started improvising and saying someone's son son of yeah that's like like you'll see in the older translations it's always son of and then in the newer translations it's like someone's son um for example genesis 6 if you look at the modern catholic bible sometimes it will say um uh alihim's sons came into the daughters of men so sometimes it's like yeah, it's just like a wording thing. I think I think is a translation thing, is they 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 opt to word it uh, the opposite way. I think is what they're doing. Okay, that makes sense. Yes. First Chronicles chapter ten. Now the Philistines warred against Yahshua, and they fled from before the Philistines and fell down slain in Mount Gabu. And the Philistines pursued after Shaul and after his sons. And the Philistines smote Jonathan and Aminadab uh, and Melchizedek, sons of Shaul. And the battle prevailed against Shaul, and the archers hit him with bows and arrows, and they were wounded of the bows. And Shaul said to his armor bearer, Draw your sword and pierce me through with it, lest these uncircumcised come and mock me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was greatly afraid. So Shaul took a sword and fell upon it. Second. Chapter 
Shaul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and pierce me through with it, lest these uncircumcised come and mock me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was greatly afraid. So Shaul took a sword and fell upon it. And his armor bearer saw that Shaul was dead, and he also fell upon it. So I um, just wanted to touch on that real quick, because I was listening to um, one of our older teachings, and Sister Marissa had just mentioned um, that uh, Shaul was very very proud and wanted to be wanted um, Samuel to baruch him or um, in front of the people even after he knew that he had done wrong and this just kind of seems like one of those same instances um, he he doesn't want to be mocked for being uh, killed and wounded of a bow he wants to be he wants them to uh, for I, I guess there was some type of maybe greater honor and dying by a sword. It's the only thing that I can take from that, but he's uh, wanting him to kill him with a sword um, so that they don't mock him. So he ends up taking his, killing himself. Um, but um, verse five, his armor bearer saw that Shaul was dead and he also fell upon his sword. So Shaul died and his three sons on that day and all his family died at the same time. And all the men of Yashual that were in the valley saw that Yashual fled and that Shaul and his sons were dead. And they left their cities and fled and the Philistines came and dwelt in them. And it came to pass in the next day that the Philistines came to strip the slain and they found Shaul and his sons fallen on Mount Galbu. And they stripped him and took his head and his armor and sent them into the land of the Philistines round about to proclaim the glad tidings to their idols and to the people. And they put their armor in the house of their mighty one and they put his head in the house of Dagon. And the dwellers in Galaad heard of all that the Philistines had done to Shaul and the Yashual. And all the mighty men rose up from Galaad and took the body of Shaul and the bodies of his sons and brought them to Yabis and buried their bones under the oak in Yabib or in Yabis and fasted seven days. So Yaul died for his transgression, wherein he transgressed against Yahuwah, against the word of Yahuwah, for as much as he kept it not. That word, it, doesn't seem to be there. For as much as he kept not, because Shaul inquired of a wizard to seek counsel, and Samuel the prophet answered him, and he sought not Yahuwah. So he slew him and turned the kingdom to Daud, the son of, uh, the son of Yesi. First Chronicles chapter 11. And all Yashra came to Daud and Hebron, saying, Behold, we are your bones and your flesh. And heretofore, when Shaul was king, you were he that led Yashra in and out. And Yahuwah of Yashra said to you, You shall feed my people, Yashra, and you shall be for a ruler of Yashra. And all the elders of Yashra came to the king to Hebron, and King Dawu made a covenant with them in Hebron before Yahuwah. And they anointed Dawu to be king over Yashra according to the word of Yahuwah by Samuel. And the king and his men went to Yerushalayim. This is Yabuz, and there the Yebusites, the inhabitants of the land, said to Dawu, It's saying that Yerushalayim was Yabus, um, where the Yebusites were dwelling. So unless Yabus was also known as Salem, then that might contradict Salem being Yerushalayim. You should not enter into, you should not enter in hither, but he took the stronghold of Zion. This is the city of Daud. And Daud said, whoever first smites the Yebuzite, even he shall be chief and captain. And Yoab, the son of Sarurai, went up first and became chief. And Daud dwelt in the stronghold. Therefore, he called it the city of Daud. And he fortified the city round about. And Daud continued to increase and Yahuwah Almighty was with him. And these are the chiefs, the mighty men whom Dawood had, who strengthened themselves with him in his kingdom, with all Yahshua to make him king, according to the word of Yahuwah concerning Yahshua. And this is the list of the mighty men of Dawood. 
Yesu Bara, son of Rakimon, first of the 30. He drew his sword once against 300 whom he slew at one time. And after him, Eleazar, son of Dadai, the Akokite, he was among the three mighty men. He was with Daud and Fasadamin and the Philistines. This is one of my favorite chapters. And the Philistines were gathered there to battle, and there was a portion of the field full of barley, and the people fled before the Philistines. And he stood in the midst of the portion and rescued it and smote the Philistines, and Yahuwah brought a great deliverance. And three of the 30 chiefs went down to the rock, to Daud, to the cave of Wadolam, and the camp of the Philistines was in the giant's valley. And Daud was then in the hold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And Daud longed and said, who will give me water to drink at the well of Bethlehem that is in the gate? And the three broke through the camp of the Philistines, and they drew water out of the well that was in Bethlehem, which was in the gate. And they took and came to Daud, but Daud would not drink it, and poured it out to Yahuwah and said, Yahuwah forbid that I should do this thing. Shall I drink the blood of these men with their lives? For with the peril of their lives they brought it, so he would not drink it. These things did the three mighty men. And Abisah, the brother of Joab, he was chief of three. He drew his sword against 300 slain at one time. And he had a name among the second three. He was more famous than the two others of the three. And he was chief over them, yet he reached not to the first three. And Benai, the son of Yodai, was the son of a mighty man. Many were his acts for Kabasaal. And he smote two lion-like men of Moab. And he went down and smote a lion in a pit in a snowy day. He went down and smote a lion in a pit on a snowy day. And he smote a Mitzrite and a wonderful man, five cubits. And in the land of the Mitzrites, there was a spear like a weaver's beam. And Benaiah went down to him with the staff and took the spear out of the Mitzrite's hands and slew him with his own spear. These things did Benaiah, son of Yodai, and his name was among the three mighty. He was distinguished beyond the 30, yet he reached not to the first three. And Daud set him over his family. And the mighty men of the forces were Asa'al, the brother of Joab, Helianan, the son of Dodai of Bethlehem, Samaot, the Adorite, Keles, the Philonite, Ola, the son of Akis, the Tekoite, Abiezer, the Anothite, Sobakai, the Yusatite, Eli, the Akonite, Morai, the Nephtophotite, Ketsaod, the son of Nuza, the Nephtophotite, Ari, the son of Rubai of the hill of Benjamin, Benias, the Perathonite, Uri of Nakali, Gaos, Abiel, the Garabathite, Asbon, the Baramite, Aliaba, the Salabonite, the son of Assam, the Gizanite, Jonathan, the son of Sora, the Alarite, Akim, the son of Akar, the Alarite, Elzlat, the son of Hirafar, the Mekorathrite, Rakia, the Phelonite, Asir, the Karmadite, uh, Naarai, the son of Azobai, Yoel, the son of Nathan, Nibaal, son of Agari, Sile, the son of Ammoni, Nakor, the Bedrothite, armor bearer to the son of Sarai, Ira, the Gethrite, Geber, the Gethrite, Uriah, the Hittite, Sebet, son of Achaiah, Adina, son of Saaza, chief of Reuben, and 30 with him, Anan, the son of Muaka, and Yosephat, the Mathanite, Osiah, the Asterite, Uzziah the uh, Asterothite, Samatha and Yael, sons of Kotham, the Adarite, Yadiel, the son of Zisamari, and Uzziah, his brother, the Thosite, Aliel, the Mo Meoite, and Yaribi, and Uzziah, his son, Elaam, and Yathama, the Moabite, Deliel, and Obeth, and Yasiel of Musobia. And that was it.
I don't really have much to expound on. Just a bunch of couple personal personal notes, but nothing really to expound. So go ahead, brother Gus. Okay. Well, I found something that me and you were talking about the other day. I didn't have the exact verse to give you on Telegram, but here it is right here. Verse 33 of chapter 9. These were the sinners, the temple sinners, heads of the family of the Levites. So the Levites were the temple sinners, which is kind of interesting because today we see everyone trying to be a sinner now. <laughs> the body of Messiah. So I wonder if that's you who is uh, will or not. Because um, in the Levitical priesthood system, it was very specific. There was temple singers, and then you had people that would, you know, join in the worship, what have it. But, you know, like these worship teams, I doubt there's Levites in these worship teams you see in Christianity and even in the Messianic movement. I doubt, I doubt any of them are actually ethnic Levites. Um so there, there might be like a minority of maybe by just by default, there might be some that are, that have a Levite lineage, who knows, but most of them, you know, we don't go by this system because we don't even realize it. That's, it's, it's a specific system that you who had in the temple. Um, and uh, it seems like Levites were the only professional singers he had in, in, as far as the going worship goes, um, you know, it's it, the temple singers were Levites. They were, they were held to a very high standard. Um, you know, so that's just something to think about. Um, see here. They lived in Jerusalem. Uh, Mocha, Gibeon. That's again, that's, Oh, okay. I see what they did. <clears throat> Sometimes the Masoretic will like add certain things I'm noticing. Like it says lived in Gibeon for verse 35. The Septuagint doesn't have that. Like they're adding in certain things. Um, let me see here. Going towards the end of chapter nine here. I don't think there's anything else. Let's see chapter 10. I don't think much, much was there. Um, eight was interesting about Obadiah chapter 8 verse 38 mentions Obadiah I wonder if that's the same Obadiah that um the book of Obadiah is written by um let's see Cain's book of Cain's according to chapter 9 verse 1 they actually give you a date when the book of Cain's is supposed to be written in a way because it says this is all Yashrael, even their enrollment, and these are written down in the book of kings of Yashrael and Judah with the names of them that were carried away to Babylon for their transgressions. So I kind of wonder if that's saying that the book of kings was written around that time, um, because most timelines actually pinpoint them around that time. Like usually, Mom, what, what timeline – like what Bible timeline do they usually put the the Book of Kings at? Was it like six hundred BC or seven hundred BC? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe not exactly when they're in Babylon, but like pretty close to the Babylonian mm -hmm. captivity. Okay. Um. So I thought that was interesting. Mentions the captivity and. And everything, and supposedly all this that we're reading in the prior chapters are is recorded also in the Book of Kings. Um, let's see, the priest Levi's point ones. Okay, I think that's about it. I didn't really catch much from chapter ten and eleven. Um, so I'm gonna let Brother Joshua go. Because uh, he mentioned he had some uh, a couple of personal points, if he wants to bring oh. them. Yep. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were saying that you're going to let me go because I mentioned that I had a couple personal things I had to go take care yeah. of. I was like, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Like, like you wanted to bring up a couple, of like, um, you know, thing. I don't know if there was anything that's that. Oh you no, they were just, um, they were just little tidbits that just kind of stuck out to me that um i really didn't look too much into that that i'd have to really go back and look at them um in order to see what 
I don't, I don't really have anything to expound on them about, you know, they're just kind of things that stuck out to me. Um, I did find, um, if you don't mind, I did find the notes that I was talking about um, regarding Isaiah. Sure. Um, uh, so Isaiah, it was actually Isaiah 30. Um, Isaiah 30, 20 and 21. So in the Masoretic, this would seem to, it seems like they're trying to hide one, one thing I see, well, I'll just go ahead and read it. From, but Masoretic says, and though Yahuwah give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not your teachers be removed into a corner anymore, or your teachers shall not be removed into a corner anymore but your eyes shall see your teachers. And then that same verse in the Septuagint reads, um, yet they, uh, and Yahuwah shall give you the bread of affliction and scant water. Yet they that cause you to err shall no more at all draw near to you for your eyes shall see those that cause you to err. So the Septuagint is saying, that those who cause you to err shall no more draw near to you. Um, but the, the Masoretic is saying your teachers shall no longer be removed. Um, so it's almost like the, the ones that are erring or the ones that cause them to err, the Masoretes, the, the, the Pharisaic ones, the Talmudic ones, um, completely took that and reworded it. Um, to kind of just hide their hide their own butts, so to speak, you know. Um, versus, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, because um, let me see. I, I I did a video about this because this verse always confused me, and people have actually thought like, why does it say you're going to go? You hear a voice behind you saying, go to the right or to the left. And I've heard people actually interpret the Masoretic version as Yahuwah is telling you to go to the right or the left. But the Septuagin version clearly is showing it's talking about false teachers telling you to go to the right or to the left. And which actually agrees with like everywhere else in scripture. Um, I just want to, I want to kind of show people where... This is a video I did a while back. It's called What Does Isaiah 30, 21 Mean? So anyone that's interested about this topic, because I did like a whole little short study about all these cross-references here from Joshua, Matthew. Um, there's what a video is this? Um, what Does Isaiah 30, 21 Mean? And so I basically took the Septuagint version of that verse and found tons of cross references about the concept of turning to the right or to the left. Yahuwah doesn't cause us to do that, but false teachers and Satan will. And that's what the Septuagint is actually saying in that verse is saying they, they see now who the voices were that told them to go to the right or to the left. It was the false teachers. The way the Masoretic reads it, it's like people have interpreted saying that it's talking about Yahuwah telling them to go to right or left. And like, that makes no sense at all. So, so uh, I think the way the Masoretic, I agree with you, the, Ma the Masoretic monkeyed up that verse pretty badly. Um, and pretty much it, it even says in the Septuagint, they led you astray who say, this is the way, let us walk in it to the right or to the left which would agree with Numbers 22.26, Deuteronomy 2.27, Deuteronomy 5.32, Deuteronomy 17.11. All these are talking about who are commanding that don't go to the right or to the left. Deuteronomy 7, yeah, Deuteronomy 28.1, Joshua 1.7, Joshua 23.6. By the way, all these verses you can find it in the Masoretic literally agree with the Septuagint version of that verse Joshua just read. So literally the Masoretic is contradicting itself the way people would read Isaiah 30, 21 in the Masoretic and think that who is the one telling them to go to the right or the left does not make any sense at all. It would contradict a lot of scripture. Um, 2 Kings 22, 2. 
Um, he did what was right in the eyes of Yahuwah, walked in all the ways of his father David, did not turn aside to the right or to the left. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Proverbs 4.27 Turn your foot away from evil. So it's saying if you go to the right or to the left in Proverbs that you are doing evil. Matthew 7, 14. And I believe Yahushua's, this is the reason he talks about stay straight on the narrow road, right? This is why he's talking about this because this is a Torah concept. You right. don't go to the right or to the left. Matthew 7, 14, because straight is the gate, narrow is the way, which leads into life, if you there be to find it. In that same chapter, it says, wide is the gate, right or left, you could say, that go to destruction. So Yahushua is pulling from that concept in that verse there. So um, it's, it's like he's almost using like a Hebrew idiom there, you know, wide versus narrow. Um, so Isaiah 30, 21, in the full context of it, is talking about these people led them astray to the right or to the left, not that Yahuwah led them to the right or to the left, um, which so in some versions of the Masoretic, people get that assumption. They think that that's what it's saying. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to kind of expound on what I meant by that and what that video is about. So the video is called, What Does Isaiah 30, 21 Mean? Um, and you can find it on the YouTube channel there. So I did that a while ago, um, just to kind of explain to people, because some people were asking me, they were like, what the heck does that mean? The way the Masoretic puts it is confusing. It doesn't make sense. Because even the ISR, it's weird. It says your ears hear a word behind you saying, this is the way walk in it. When, whenever you turn to the right or whenever you turn to the left, it makes no mention about the teacher's at all so it makes no mentions about leading astray and that's the problem so people actually would interpret verse 21 um as you know that the voice behind you would be the father and i've heard people say that like incorrectly interpreting it that way so i'm just wanting to explain that um but anyway so that was a good point to bring up, Brother Joshua. Huge difference in the Septuagint versus the Masoretic in that verse. Huge difference. And um, two more points, if you don't mind. Yeah, no problem. Um, so 31.8 in the, let's see, 31.8 reads, And the Assyrian shall fall. Not the sword of a great man, nor the sword of a mean man shall devour him, nor shall he flee from the face of the sword, but the young man shall be overthrown. Actually, two points right there. One, it seems that he's, when it says he shall not flee from the face of the sword, which you pointed out um, is, is Yahushua, um, it, it almost seems like, uh, because he's not fleeing, that he's he's defying all the way to the end all the way into death um but the young and then it says but the young men shall be overthrown when i looked at that word young men um it can read young men but it could also mean young servant or young attendant um and it just kind of reminded me of um when i was sharing with my mom just um why witchcraft what why Harry Potter is wrong and why it is real witchcraft. And it's not just make believe. Um, and I was showing her a lot of the, um, a lot of the goals, um, a lot of the, the things that they have, that uh, a lot of witches have instituted into our society, into um, the modern school system. Um, one of their goals, and they actually have this, um, they actually have this in a book for, for people out there, um, one of their goals is to, um, to reach the young, to try to get, um, try to get the young converted to witchcraft, to, to Luciferianism. Um, even JK Rowling even came out and admitted that she wrote those books, um, because she was trying to convert kids to Wicca. Um, and so it's just, it, when I see that where it says the young men shall be overthrown, it just kind of um, reminds me of that, that Satan is, is taught more than while he targets everybody, he seems to definitely be targeting the young, the, um, 
the naive um, a lot more so. Um, whether that's what that implies or not, it's just what it remind, reminded me of. Um, and the tar, you mentioned in the Targum of 30, uh, chapter, I think it was chapter 30, verse 3, you said Sheol prepared its mouth deep and wide. Um, just reminded me of the way the way to destruction is is broad and wide. Um, and then 33, verse 17, um, you mentioned in the Targum it read something about seeing those who descend. Let me go to this in the Septuagint. Um, you mentioned it said seeing those who descend into Sheol. Um, in the Septuagint, it reads, um, I'm going to start in verse 15. He that walks in righteousness, speaking rightly, hating transgression and iniquity, and shaking his hands from gifts, stopping his ears that he should not hear the judgment of blood, shutting his eyes that he should not see injustice. He shall dwell in a high cave of a strong rock. Bread shall be given him, and his water shall be sure. You shall see a king with esteem. Your eyes shall behold a land from afar. Um, so one, we know that the righteous will not see him in his esteem. Um, and then when you said that uh, where it says in the Septuagint, your eyes shall behold a land from afar, you said that in the Targum it sees, it said you shall see those who descend uh, into, into Sheol. I think you said it should read Gehenna. Um, but it, it just kind of, both of those put together um, remind me of um, uh, the parable of, uh, of the rich man and Lazarus. Um, where on one side you have Lazarus looking over and seeing Abraham in, uh, uh, or seeing uh, the rich man looking over and seeing Lazarus in Abraham's bosom, um, you know, being at rest. Um, but on the other hand, you, I'm pretty sure that uh, while it doesn't say this, I'm sure that they could see um Lazarus could see the rich men on the other side. So it's kind of like they're seeing uh, these people descending. Am I, am I making any sense of that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the idea of um, the fiery gulf that's between them and he's, he's, Lazarus sees the guy in torment. Yeah, that's actually what the parable of the rich man is actually about. Um, it's not that um, one is in heaven and one is the lake of fire. It's actually about Sheol and the underworld. To add to your point, that's that's the whole point Yahushua was trying to relate to them was that there's a wicked place in, in when you go down to the grave. There's a wicked place of the grave where you, you're going through some type of fiery torment um, until judgment day. And then you have Abraham's bosom where peaceful, you're at rest, you're at peace. Um, and, um, according to historians, the reason why he gave that to the Pharisees, that parable to the Pharisees was the Pharisees thought because of their outward appearance mm -hmm. that they automatically would be in Abraham's bosom when they died. So he was trying to scare them a little bit. He was trying to put some fear into them. Like, listen, man, it doesn't matter what you do, how much money you have and all that, and your material possessions, the way you treat people you're going to be punished for that. Yeah. And, and that was the point of it was like, your, your, you know, whitewashed tombs, whitewashed tombs are still going to go down to the fiery Gulf of Sheol. It, it, you know, you, the way, if you care so much about your outward, trying to look outwards set apart, but inward, you're not set apart. There's no point to that. And that's kind of what he was trying to relate to him, relate to them because in their culture, <laughs> For some reason, around Yahusha's time, people in Jerusalem, they, they were all outward. They were all yeah, well. squeaky clean image on the outside, but then dead man's bones on the inside. Mm -hmm. And that's why Yahusha was trying to relate to them. You know, don't, don't be so sure you're going to be the one on Abraham's bosom side before the resurrection. Don't be so sure about that. Um, you know. 
and you know that so but but yeah that concept's actually found in enoch too where it even mentions that abel's blood was still crying mm. um even at that point of enoch's time period crying from the ground and uh making accusation against his brother what his brother did mm. you know also. so uh there that also that, when you mm -hmm. go ahead um, I was going to say also, so when you have, uh, it says also that he looked up and saw Abraham in his bosom. And so like when you see, it says in 16, he shall dwell in a high cave of a strong rock um, and your eyes shall behold a land from afar. When you envision um, uh, a mountain and a cave and then looking at a land from afar off um, on the, uh, you're looking down, but those that are in the land from afar off are going to be looking up. And the rich man was looking up. So oh, interesting. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, I think that verse two is talking about the promised land. And uh, basically, mm -hmm. a, a lot of that is millennial language that we read today in Isaiah. A lot of millennial language. A lot of millennial context. Um, and, you know, so that's, there was a lot of good stuff from Isaiah today. Um, let's see, me and Brother Dennis, we are going to finish this thing out here. So me and Brother Dennis will split up the New Testament portion. I'm going to do a new recording here.